The appeal of Stalinism has not been limited to Russia. Many leaders followed in Stalin's footsteps. Stalin's methods were taken on board by governments of socialist countries and by leaders who aspired to build socialism in Asia, Africa, Latin America. Of course, uh, Stalinism was the order of the day in the countries dominated by the USSR, such as those in Eastern Europe uh, or Mongolia. There, Stalinism was imposed by Stalin himself or by his heirs. But in many other countries, systems similar to Stalinism were homegrown. Leaders of such regimes did not necessarily recognize Stalin as their model, though some did. Of course, each had specific national characteristics, but they also had a lot in common. All were building a bright socialist future. More often than not, they came to power in the cause of or after a war. Without exception, countries with such regimes were poor. The majority of their population was barely literate and socially backward. Without exception, they tried to speed up history by taking what they thought was a short cut to welfare, prosperity and equality. The magic trick to reach these goals uh, in just a few years uh, consisted of nationalization of the economy and ideological reorientation of the population. Force was the very core of any such system. It simply could not be built without repression. Millions of deaths were not too high a price to pay for the future happiness of the rest of the population. A personality cult was usually uh, a part of the system. One such case was Mao Zedong's China. This is Stalin's portrait in a small village in China in 2009, which means that Stalin is still popular there. Mao Zedong came to power after more than 20 years of civil war and war of liberation against the Japanese occupation. Mao was a young Marxist-Leninist, but as a leader he was formed by war. He rose in the ranks of the Communist Party of China through war, and the core of his party colleagues and leaders were his fellow fighters. Stalin's relations uh, with uh, Chinese communists were not easy. Lenin supported uh, the Chinese Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, led by Sun Yat-sen. Stalin continued this line. He advised communists to use Kuomintang as a launching pad to power. Exactly the opposite, however, happened. In 1927, two years after Sun Yat-sen's death, the Kuomintang new leaders massacred thousands of communists. In 1945, Mao's guerrillas were fighting both against uh, the Japanese and the Kuomintang. Just at that time, Stalin signed an agreement with Kuomintang's leader, Chiang Kai-shek. But soon Stalin started to assist Mao as well, despite the agreement with Chiang Kai-shek. At the last stages of the war, Soviet military assistance became indispensable. There were serious theoretical differences between Stalin and Mao. Mao believed in the revolutionary potential of peasants. For him, they were the main force of the socialist revolution. For the Soviets, this was a left-wing deviation. Despite this, Mao needed Stalin's help. Mao treated Stalin with the veneration appropriate for an older leader of the first socialist state. More importantly, he learned from Stalin's experience of social engineering. 
The People's Republic of China was proclaimed on 1st October 1949. But already in 1946, Mao launched a land reform in the liberated areas. Landlords' property was expropriated and redistributed to the peasants. This was a very popular move. It brought the party the support of millions of peasants. This is a poster of the land reform. The reality was uh, much more cruel because a large number of former landowners were beaten to death. Uh, Mao himself estimated uh, the number of victims at about 800,000. Estimates by researchers range between a million and several million people. The campaign was a part of war and death was seen as a natural outcome. The next campaign unfolded in 1950-1952. It was the campaign of suppression of counter-revolutionarism. Look at the left poster. You can see that a counter-revolutionary is being dragged from somewhere underground or under floor. And, uh, of course, uh, the campaign was aimed against various oppositions, common tongue officials, businessmen, and suspe suspicious intellectuals. Uh, they were terrorized, and uh, many were killed. Mao himself defined the quarter of executions in each region and closely followed the proceedings. The quarters, as in the USSR, were over-fulfilled. Estimates of the number of victims differ between several hundred thousand and two million. Many more were sent to labor camps from which they never returned. According to different estimates, between 15 million and 27 million died in the camps during Mao's rule. Trials and executions were accompanied by massive propaganda campaigns. In Beijing alone, the total number of those who participated in the proceedings went into several dozen million. There is no doubt that these campaigns consolidated the party's grip on the country and Mao's personal power, but they also entrenched the idea that social progress could only be achieved through the death of its enemies. In 1953, Mao launched his own first five-year plan. Uh, it was centered on industrialization. The Soviet Union rendered massive financial and technical assistance. Many plants and factories were built and urban population significantly increased. But the process was uh, characterized by the same problems as uh, the Soviet industrialization. Poor financial planning, poor quality of production, massive human sacrifice. These happy pictures, as in the USSR, uh, did not reflect the reality. The Hundred Flowers Campaign, 1956-57, it was something like Khrushchev's Thor. Uh, the Hundred Flowers Campaign was launched by the party with the purpose of promoting a debate on the future of the country. The debate was supposed to prove that socialism was the best system. Uh, it was supposed to attract the support of the non-communists, particularly among the intelligentsia. But Mao's thought proved even shorter than Khrushchev's. When people started to criticize the party seriously and even called for democratization, Mao abruptly stopped the campaign. This happened in June 1957. In this picture, you see what happened next. Those who had criticized the party, mostly the intelligentsia, were charged with rightism and persecuted. After this, there was no criticism of any aspects of Mao's policy. 
Some historians think that from the start the campaign was a trick aimed at exposing dissidents. Whatever the original goal, there is no doubt that the uprisings in eastern Germany, Hungary and Poland proved to mar the dangers of liberalization. He decided at that point that the new Soviet cause did not suit China and he wanted to lead the country forward by the Stalinist route.